So what I want you to see today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 15. Amy, this is for you. Chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. I'm going to ask you to find your place in God's word. Once you find it, I'm going to ask you to join me standing as we read from God's word. Matthew chapter 15. Beginning in verse 21. Everyone standing, no pages are rustling. The scripture reads, Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. For my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, Father, clear my mind, Lord. With a multitude of thoughts shooting through there, Lord, I ask you, Father, to help me to focus on your word this morning and on your message for your people. Father, will you speak to our hearts even now through the power of your spirit, for we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. So on the heels of Jesus' teaching, we're going through the synoptic gospels is what we're doing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's four gospel accounts. And the four gospels were written by four different people to four different audiences, really. So the Gospel of Matthew records the next event after Jesus teaches about purity. And, the, and he goes into this demon-possessed woman. The first thing I want you to see here is this. This is like the fourth part of Jesus' ministry. He actually leaves beyond the border of Israel. He actually leaves. His ministry goes beyond the region of Galilee. That's what's happening here. He didn't limit his ministry to the people of Israel only. He went beyond the borders of his nation. You missed that in the text. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him. Go back, uh, uh, verse 21, um, Amy, please. Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. That would be like us leaving Highland and going into the regions of Hammond and East Chicago. Are you following me? So he leaves, but it was greater than that because he left, the, he left his, his nation and he went into where these Gentiles were. These Gentiles were non Jews. So now we have a non-Jewish woman comes to him. We have two problems. A, she's non-Jewish, and B, she's a woman. We see this demonstrated again when he's at the well. But what happens? This Gentile woman who lives there comes to him and is pleading. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Interesting. Many of the Jews in the previous passages that we are reading reject Jesus Christ. Yet this Gentile woman recognizes him for who, she, who he is, and she's asking him for mercy. My daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. You know what's happening here? A, she recognizes Jesus as Messiah. B, she's asking, she's submitting herself to the, to the lordship of Christ. C, she believes in faith that he has the power and the ability to do what she's asking him to do. That he is sovereign over these demons. In one statement, she says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Go to verse 23. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. What in the world was Jesus thinking? He ignored her. She gave, he gave her no reply, not even a word. This is an NLT translation. Does anybody's translation read different? Anyone? He answered her not a word. What's going on here? Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away. She's bothering us with all her begging. You know what that implies? That she didn't just ask him one time. Because she's begging, with all her begging. Anybody's translation read different? Yeah. All her begging. So she keeps crying out. Keeps crying out. Yeah. And what's the other part? She keeps crying out after us. After she me. keeps crying out after us. I mean, what else? Anybody else read different? So here we have a lady. A, she's not Jewish. B, she's a woman. Got no business talking to men. She comes up to Jesus. She says, have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a spirit. Jesus ignores her, so she persists. 
What's the implication? Twofold, church. One, sometimes Jesus is just silent. You ever pray and not get the answer right away? Not get the answer you wanted? The answer you hoped for? That ever happened to you? So she got mad and she threw something at him, the scripture says. Right? No. The scripture says she got mad and switched denominations because, you know, Baptist prayer ain't working. She got mad and went to, you know, she went to another church because that church, is, the spirit ain't there. Is that what the scripture says? The Bible says that she was persistent in her begging, which is consistent with another parable that Jesus talks about with the judge. You remember that one? I won't even get into that. The point is persistence. A, sometimes we pray and God doesn't move. Why? Because it ain't his time. That's why. It's just not time. We don't like that, church, because we think it's about us and we think it's about now. And I think God ought to move when I say he ought to move. Well, God don't work that way, church. He don't. And if that's the God you want to serve, then you know what? Go, go create one because our God don't function that way. So Jesus doesn't say anything to her, not even a word. At first, when I read this passage, I said, why, why would Jesus be rude to her like that? I think he was teaching us something. He was teaching her something and he was teaching his disciples something. Always a teachable moment with Christ. Always. Tell her to go away with all of her begging. She's bothering us. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. What's the other implication here? You ever have somebody that needs to be ministered to? They're a little. Here, it's an opportunity. And we see it as a nuisance. <laughs> the disciples were annoyed here. When they should have seen an opportunity. Rather than being aware of somebody's need, she just said, hey, my daughter is possessed. That's a spiritual need. And rather than being aware, they were annoyed. Church, if you can't say amen, you must say ouch. I don't know how many times people call me at the most inopportune times. I got one eye open trying to see who we're calling. We don't want to stop doing what we're doing. Sometimes we're doing something important. And the important things take away from what God is probably trying to do. The disciples missed the opportunity. They were annoyed. Rather than being aware, they were annoyed. You know, the fact that he left Galilee into another nation, and he left the nation of Israel, also implies to us that we ought to be doing the same thing. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses into Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We have a responsibility to spread the gospel. And this church... We can't reach Highland by ourselves. People say, oh, my gosh, another church in Highland? Seriously? You think all the churches in Highland is enough to reach the people in Highland? It's not. Send her away. She's bothering us. Go to the next verse, Amy. Jesus said to the woman, oh, my goodness. If you thought him ignoring her was bad, wait till we get to the next verses. Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Wow. Somebody got to go, if somebody has a Bible, a copy of God's word, go to Romans chapter 116, verse 16, chapter 116. If you got it, let me know. I want you to read it for me. Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. Gentile, non-Jew, you're not from Israel. Bye, Felicia. He don't want anything to do with her. All right, 116, who's got it? Anyone? Go ahead, Frank. The Jew first, then for the Gentile. What translation? New King James, which one did you have, Bernadette? NIV, would you read it? For everyone who believes, God wants to reach the whole world, but the Jews first. Why? Because he wanted the Jews to be responsible for helping him spread that word. Well, the Jews decided they didn't want it as they rejected him, and the Bible clearly taught that. It said that it was prophesied that Jesus would be rejected by his own people, the Messiah would be. So whose responsibility is it now? It is us, church. The Bible says that we have been grafted and we're like the Jews. Now, God has, we have been adopted into the family of God and we have a responsibility. God wants to use me. He wants to use you to reach the world, to share the gospel. When Jesus said, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel, 
That is us. We've been grafted in with them. We have a responsibility to reach those people now. And we're, being, we're missing the blessing. We're missing the opportunity. You know, studies show that the average Christian, it's over like 90% of Christians never, ever lead somebody else to Christ. Ever. They don't share their faith. And no one, so I get saved by, by the Lord saves me through, through a friend who's witnessing and shares the gospel with me. I receive Christ. And then I live the rest of my life and never lead another person to Christ. That's what the majority of Christians do. They say, Pastor, I don't know how. That is hogwash. You might not know how, but you're not even trying to learn. That's, a, that's an excuse. So I read this passage. And in context, it sounds harsh. Go to verse 25. But the same, but she came worshiping him, pleading again, Lord, help me. <laughs> she ain't going away that easy. Amen? Verse 26. Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Uh, I said, oh, man, how am I supposed to preach that? Jesus is supposed to love everybody. Jesus is supposed to be, you know, Jesus. So what are we talking about here? The Jews had a harsh attitude towards these Gentiles. They wanted nothing to do with them. They referred to them as dogs. Jesus says it at the well. He tells the lady, how is it that you're talking to me? I'm Jew, I'm Jew and you're not. You're a lady, I'm a dude. How is this happening? And the lady says, because I'm thirsty. And Jesus said, if you knew who you was talking to, you would realize Okay, and so Jesus uses that opportunity, and he tells her, basically, he says, why are you talking to me, the lady at the well? Sounds harsh, but it's an opportunity for him to swing the door wide open. So this is what Jesus did. He's the master communicator. Jesus is God Almighty. So he tells this woman, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Bam! Hits the disciples right between the eyes and hits the Gentile woman right between the eyes with a term that they've created. They, terminology, hey, hey, they just, you know, hey, hey, you know. Uh, a, a word we use today is like on the streets is gangbangers, hood rats, right? If you said something like that, people would understand what you're talking about. I didn't make this word up, but if I used it in context, those people familiar with that terminology would connect. Amen? That's what Jesus is doing. He's using his dog terminology so that they can connect. And it's a beautiful illustration. He says it isn't right to take the food from the children, the children of Israel, God's people. The food, the bread that he was talking about two weeks, remember that? Two weeks in a row we've been talking about eating food eating bread, eating flesh, remember that? It isn't right for me to take the bread of life, the living bread, and feed these dogs with it. I think he was getting to the next point, but she beat him to the punch. Go to the verse 27. <laughs> she replied, I'm out of here. You offended me. That's, what she's, what trans, that's not a translation. Uh, she replied, that's true, Lord. But even... Dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Faith, once again, church. Persistence, once again. It's beautiful. As I think about my dogs, I don't feed my dogs table scraps. You get dog food. However, if you see meat, popcorn, you'd understand some happens to fall on the floor. <laughs> my grandson has mastered the art. You see us at the movies, and Tina's like, you're wasting half the bag. We're like, ha, ha, ha. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And we take a bag home every time, and the day-old popcorn tastes the best, but it's a mess. Amen. It's all over the floor. We don't even pick it up because the dogs are like, <laughs> like a vacuum cleaner sucking it up. So the popcorn, I didn't bring it home for my dogs. I brought it home for me and my grandson and my wife and whoever else wants to partake in this beautiful slice of heaven called popcorn. But when it falls on the floor, the dogs can have it. Jesus said, hey, it's not right for me to give you the food that's intended for the children. And the lady says, yeah, but you know what? Even dogs eat the scraps. She's telling Jesus, I'll take the scraps. I'll take the little bit of blessing that you're willing to give me. I'll take it, Jesus. And we Christians, we're like, we sit at the table. We don't even want to eat. But we don't want the dogs to have it either. That's sad, church. There's a real sad truth here. But the woman's faith is incredible. Incredible. Look what Jesus says in verse 28. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. Where's her daughter at? Where's the pastor say she was at? The pastor didn't even say where she was at. 
the woman made reference to her daughter, and Jesus said, your request is granted, and her daughter was instantly healed. Go to the next verse. Okay. And different gospel or different translation, because I read so much, they said she, the, the, the daughter was healed. She was at home. Jesus showed that he was, listen to this, church. You've got to understand this. Jesus demonstrated once again that he is sovereign over space and time. He has authority over even the demons from a, a distance. That'd be like me coming here today, my daughter being in, in Maryville, and I tell Jesus, Jesus, can you heal my daughter? Can he do that? Yes. Absolutely. Jesus don't have to be in Maryville. He don't have to be in my house to do it. Right. Jesus can do it because he's God. Yeah. Jesus said, your faith is incredible, woman. Your kid is healed. Yeah. And she's like, awesome. And the Bible says that she was healed. Mm -hmm. But what's incredible to me is not the fact that Jesus can do that, because, hello, we've seen him do greater things. Yes. Amen? Amen? What's remarkable to me was the faith of the Gentile woman to not even bring her kid to Jesus in the first place. She came on her own, believing that Jesus could do it. Just say the word. Reminds me of the centurion. He says, hey, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority, Jesus. Just say the word. Say the word, Jesus, and it's done. Peter in the boat, Lord, call me unto you, and I'll come. Understanding the power of Jesus Christ, sovereign over all creation, even the demonic. Amen? Wow. So Jesus returns to the Sea of Galilee and climbs the hill and sits down. <laughs> I love his disciples. They were never, they were never uh, afraid to ask questions. Verse 29, okay. Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee, climbs the hill and sits down. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame. In the parallel passage in Mark chapter 7, the Bible says that, G let me read it. Jesus left Tyre and went to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee, the region of ten towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and people begged Jesus to lay his hands on them. Uh, it was the other, it was the other, the other passage. Uh, the passage I just covered in Mark actually says Jesus went to this town. He didn't want nobody to know he was there. <laughs> he didn't want nobody to know he was there. He had other things he was trying to do. And people, and in this passage says it's the same. It's the same passage. A vast crowd came to him anyway. They just couldn't keep it a secret. <laughs> Jesus couldn't go nowhere. He couldn't go nowhere. The crowd beat him to the other side of the lake. Remember that? We was talking about he couldn't go nowhere. The news of Jesus Christ spread like wildfire, church. And what he was doing in the lives of people was also spreading. Do you recall a time in your life, Christian, when you couldn't shut up about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about the love that you had in your heart for Jesus Christ? Do you remember that? Well, that's what was happening here. So a vast crowd brought him, this crippled man, uh, to Jesus. They brought the lame, they brought the blind, they brought the crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. And they laid them before Jesus, and he healed some of them, a few of them, one of them. How many? He healed all of them. <clears throat> Jesus had the power to do so. He had the willingness to do so. But what's incredible to me is the faith that people had in his ability to do so. Look at verse, I'm in Mark chapter 7, verse 33. I know I skipped on you. But the, Jesus left Tyre and Sidon and went to, went to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee at the region of ten towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. <clears throat> I love this. You know, some of the things Jesus does and says are bizarre. You really got to dig deep and scratch your head and think and ask the Spirit of God to enlighten you why he would do such a thing. Now, Jesus wasn't crazy. He was God Almighty. He didn't say nothing foolish. He, everything was well thought of, and it was always appealing to us, uh, his two natures, his human nature and his divine nature. So, Jesus, so they lead him away, verse 33. People begged him to lay his hands on him. To heal the man. Verse 33. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. <laughs> he put his fingers into the man's ears. What is that all about? Then spitting on his own fingers. Jesus spit on his own fingers. He touched the man's tongue. Ew. <laughs> what on earth is that about? Jesus is like. And I'm picturing this, and I'm thinking, all right, now, George, Lord, we saw you do some incredible things, but that spit. 
He touched the man's ears, spits on his own fingers, and touches the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, which means open, be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was free so he could speak plainly. Why would Jesus do that? <laughs> I don't, you know, it's amazing to me, and you really have to scratch your head, and you really have to think. Here's your application. <clears throat> the previous verse got, kind of gives you uh, an idea. Verse 32, a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him, as if Jesus has to lay his hands on you to heal you. He doesn't have to. He can say it, as we've seen. He could, and so what Jesus was demonstrating by touching and even the spitting, it's not the power of his touch that opened up the ears, even though it is. It's not the power of the spit. Okay, it is the power of God. It's not that it manifests itself in a touch or through the spit or whatever the case may be. It is the fact that it's the power of God and God can do anything he so desires in any manner he so chooses. Why is that right, Pastor? What does that mean? It means there is more than one means. You understand that? We think that a person can only get saved if he comes to church and walks the aisle and prays the sinner's prayer. True or false? That's false. We think that a person can, I mean, we, 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 we put our own restrictions on whatever it is we think we can do. God can heal you if I, you know, I, I come, I'm going to have my, 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 my church family come and we're going to, you know, anoint you with oil. And this, this is biblical now, so you got to watch it. I'm not treading on heresy here. We're going to anoint you with oil, we're going to pray over you, and God's going to heal you. That's true. But that is not the only way God chooses to heal. Right. Oh, we're not going to take my kid. My kid is dying, but I'm not going to take my kid to the hospital because we're going to trust God to heal him. Well, you know what? I believe God can do that, and God doesn't have to do it through the power of a pastor or an elder to come lay hands on him. God can do it supernaturally, and the kid could just sit up and be done. But if God chooses not to do that, God chooses to move through a doctor, then you are not being prudent to receive the help that a doctor can give you. God can certainly move through the power of a doctor as he's moved through the spit on the tongue of Jesus Christ. There's more than one means, church. Well, our church is the right church. They're the wrong ones. You know, our music is right. I mean, there's more than one means. We cannot put God into a box. God cannot be boxed. And we do it all of the time. We do it all of the time. Jesus Christ is showing that he is not bound by any particular means. That he has the power to do the things that he does in any manner that he so chooses. Why? Because he's God. So what does this mean for us? Well, for one, we see tremendous faith demonstrated in people who are not even the chosen people. Yet the people closest to him, the Jews, are the ones, the very ones, rejecting him. In the previous passage, I said, Jesus said, I'm trying to think of the exact words he said. He, he was quoting the prophet Isaiah, and he said, these people honor me with their lips, with their tongues, but their hearts are far from me. He says, their worship is a farce. It's empty, it's fake, it's all show, they're hypocrites. There really truly is no relationship. That's extraordinary. And here we see faith demonstrated by people who don't call themselves Christians, don't call themselves children of God, yet they believe that that same God is powerful. It reminds me <laughs> of the story in Exodus where the Lord sends the plagues and the Pharaoh says, you know, I don't believe in your God. If he did, he wouldn't be doing the things he did. But he tells Moses, he says, hey, do me a favor. Pray to your God and ask him to let up, will you? Because these plagues are killing me. It's a Lake County translation. But that's what he said. I don't believe in your God. Do me a favor and pray to him anyway and ask him to chill out because he's killing me. And that's not, he didn't ask him just once or twice. He continued to ask. How many of you know people who are not Christians, don't go to church, don't live a life that honors God at all? And they'll come to you and say, hey, could you do me a favor and pray for me because of X, Y, or Z? How many of you had that happen to you before? Raise your hand. 
And we, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you, and then you don't because you forgot. You got busy, and you may, hey, Lord, and you're praying at night when you're all exhausted, and you fell asleep, and you woke up with your hands in the pool of your own slob, and you forgot to pray. That ever happened to you? Don't raise your hand. But the people of God are demonstrating more faith than the, or should I say the people, the lost people, the people who are not people of God are demonstrating more faith than the so-called Christian. God forbid that that's where we're at, church, but I truly believe that we, the evangelical church as a whole, that's exactly where we're at. Maybe you're not you, praise God, if that's not you. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, here's the next event in Jesus' life. It's interesting, this little snapshot, that he left Galilee, bang, bang, just two accounts of things happening, and then off he goes back. First one, he sends the demon out of the possessed girl, and the second one, he opens the ears of the deaf man, Many people are bringing people to Jesus. He's healing them. And then he feeds 4,000 people. Sound familiar? This is a different event. The first time he fed how many people? 5,000 5, people. And he fed them with how many loaves? Five. He fed them with loaves and fish, right? Okay. What happens is there's only 5,000 people he fed. In this account, he's feeding 4,000. It's an entirely different account. Yet, the people he's feeding today in this account here, most of them are non-Jews. They're from a Roman audience that the, that the gospel is addressing. Actually, the gospel of Mark addresses it. But anyway, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, here's what the scripture says. Then Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here with me for three days. They have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry or they will faint along the way. And the disciples say, where would we get enough food? <laughs> here in the wilderness for such a huge crowd. This is frustrating. <laughs> Hello? It's like deja vu. Right. All you need is a few loaves and a couple fish and you're good. Right. He's proven this. What's the implication, church? Same thing, Same thing for us. How many times has God been faithful to you? How many times? How many times have you prayed for God to come through and he's come through? You know, when I was a kid, I loved the Bears. I was a Chicago Bears fan because me and my dad watched the games together. But the best part of that was we had Walter Payton. <laughs> games on the line, give the ball to Walter. You need a touchdown, he's going to get it. Maybe not on this down, but he'll get it in the next one. Okay, Walter Payton was your go-to guy. Seldom let you down. Sometimes he did, but not usually. Michael Jordan. Man, you want that game-winning shot, you put it in his hand. He's your go-to guy. Most of the good teams got one. When you absolutely, positively got to make the catch, got to hit the shot, you give it to that guy. You don't give it to, you know, Johnny come lately off the bench. You don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that. Not when you want to win. God has been your go-to guy how many times? How many times? And he doesn't never fail, ever. And yet we demonstrate the same faith that the disciples have when we say, well, this one's too big for him. Okay, God, there's 4,000 people here. Hello, he fed 5,000. This one's smaller. Small potatoes. God can move. He can. And yet we doubt that. And they said, where are we going to get enough food to be here? These people in the wilderness, this crowd is huge. Verse 34. Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? They replied, seven loaves. <laughs> they got more food than they had with the 5,000. How much bread do you have? Seven loaves and a few small fish, a few small fish, a few. That's probably more than two. And that's all they had when they fed 5,000. Right? Okay, I'm making sure. Oh, all we got is seven loaves and a few small fish. Church, this is what we do. When we see somebody's need, we don't have it. We really can't. We have people, benevolent. People come in, they need help. We don't, I, I don't have the money to help. <laughs> I, person asks you for money, hey, can I get some change? And you're like, oh, man, I'm broke, sorry. And you're not. It's, you don't have change, but you got dollar bills, and you got the money that, that doesn't make noise in your pocket, but you don't want to give it to them. And then you'll turn around, you drive on down to Burger King or something, get your big old meal, whop it with cheese, and you're driving, and yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of still, you throw it out. It, it, we don't think nothing of it. We have money. We have enough to do the things we want to do. We think we don't have enough to do the things, but you know what? God requires very little. A little goes a long way with God, Amen. And so what do we see here? Jesus says, how much bread do we have? They said, well, I got seven loaves and a few small fish, verse 35. So Jesus told all the people, sit down on the ground, verse 36. So the people sit down, requires effort on their part. They have to listen. They have to submit. 
Then he took the seven loaves in, of fish and thanked God for them and then broke them into pieces and he gave them to disciples who distributed the food to the crowd. Jesus prays for the food. I don't know how many times we had. We had a, a Thanksgiving banquet at the FOP a couple years ago. You guys remember that? And uh, I, yeah, I didn't expect this crowd. I don't know how many people were there, but there was way more than we expected. Right, we expected like 100, like 160 showed up. And I remember praying, Lord, <laughs> multiply this food because somebody's going to leave hungry. And you know what God was faithful to do? We had so much food left over, people were taking stuff home. I couldn't, and everybody ate. God, I, so a little goes a long way when you're, talking, when, you're, when you're dealing with God. God can do what he wants. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Verse 37. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterwards, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. Verse 38. There were 4,000 men who were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. These were not Jews. These were Gentiles. The dogs were supposed to get the crumbs. God's grace is enough. There's plenty for everyone, church. We sit around. We got the answers to the world's problems right here. Talking to a guy last night at work, and he said something about how the world is falling apart. And he said, you know, we don't, we don't, really, we don't really adhere to the biblical principles anymore. And I'm like, you think? And he says, yeah, you know. And he goes, I don't know when it's going to get better. I said, it's not. We're not. It's not. Things have changed. The pendulum's not swinging back, church. Jesus will come home before that happens. He's coming back. That's not going to happen. Not here. And this is the solution right here. I shared this before, I think at a home group maybe, or maybe, speaking of home group, I'm talking about the means, remember that? The means, Jesus spit on his fingers, the means to reach somebody. There's a person in this church who was actually reached through a home group. Not in a Sunday morning service where they came to the altar and prayed. A person who was moved by the Spirit of God in the living room of somebody else because they heard the message. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. Right. Sunday school. Tent revivals. Maybe the, evangel the preacher on TV, the televangelist, <laughs> maybe. Right. So the means is important. But I said this in a, in a home group, I'm pretty sure, maybe here on a Sunday morning. I said that I had an ethics class when I was working on my undergrad. And the ethics class asked if you had some God-forsaken disease, a family member, your wife, for example. She's got some God-forsaken disease. Ethics. Okay, we're talking ethics. Christians ought to be ethical. You got some God-forsaken disease. Your wife's going to die. However, they come up with an antidote. They have a cure for it. It's in a vial, and it's at Walgreens. You can go pick it up. I'm thinking, cool. The biggest problem is about you know, $500,000 for that little cure. What are you going to do? I'm like, I'm going to get that vial. He goes, you got 500000 I said, I will, get, I will get the vial. <laughs> yeah, we're in an ethics class. I don't want, I'm a policeman. <laughs> Can't talk like that. You're going to get stoned with rocks. So I'm like looking at him and he goes, thank you. He looks, he looks at me and he goes, well, how are you going to get it? I said, I'm going to get it. I'm going to take a loan for that 500000 I'm going to mortgage my house to the eyeballs. I'm going to work 12 jobs, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Amen? Amen? But here's what we got, Christian. What if you had a bushel basket full of those vials and you knew a bunch of people who had the same disease and you're like, I got one for my wife, and I'm going to hold on to these just in case anybody else, you know, I love and care about might need it. The rest of the world, who cares? Church, that's what we do with this. We have the answers to the sin-sick problems of the world. We don't share it with anybody. Except we didn't have to go through extreme measures to get it. Jesus gave it to us. He went through the extreme measures. We have it. We don't share it. We take it like this and go... That's what we do. There's plenty for everybody. Amen? Amen? Go to the next verse, 39. And Jesus sent the people home, and he got into a boat and crossed over to the region. I can't even pronounce the word. Where am I spot? Yeah, my translation don't even say it. Oh, yeah, it does. Magadan. Magadan. He crosses over and goes to the region of Magadan. The very next passage, Jesus actually resumes his ministry in Galilee. He goes back. So what do we take from these passages? I'm going to close here and ask the praise team to come forward. We've seen a lot in just some short passages. What do we see? We see faith demonstrated. 
Amen? Amen. By people who have no relationship with God. And we also see faith falter in the very people who say they do have a relationship with God. We see the sovereignty and the power of Jesus Christ demonstrated in the life of a, woman, of a, a young girl who's not even present. And we see, once again, Jesus coming through, providing for the needs of people, for everybody. So you ask yourself, well, what's the implication? Here it is, church. We ought to be living our lives in a manner that honors God. How do we do that? I have people tell me all the time, Pastor, well, you know, uh, uh, you don't have to do X, Y, or Z. And then my question is simple. What are you doing? You're right. It doesn't have to be X, Y, or Z. Well, I don't have to sing on the praise team in order to serve God. You're right. You don't. But what are you doing? What we do see is Jesus leaves the region of Galilee. Amen? And when he leaves the region of Galilee, he's going out and he's ministering to people. Church, we leave here. We don't, we don't even leave our Galilee. We don't. And when we do, we're like this. We don't want to minister to people. Why? Because like the lady who was begging, it's inconvenient. It's annoying. We are not aware of people's spiritual needs, and instead, we are annoyed. It's very simple, church. It really is. Our God is relational. He's a God that desires a relationship with each and every one of us. The Bible is crystal clear as the question was asked to Jesus, which commandment was the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, you, all your strength, with all that you are. He said, and the second was just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Church, none of us, none of us, if we were in need, would want people to walk past us, turn up their nose at us, not have time for us. None of us. You know what we do, though? We point a finger at people and we, we label them. You know what the word prejudice is? I tell people all the time that we all have it. People go, oh, I'm not prejudiced. You're a liar. You're a liar. We prejudge people. That's what we do. Now, you might not think you do. Trust me, you do. I told the story, I was in a Christian bookstore and I seen this big biker dude. Look scary, I thought he was gonna rob the place. I'm not kidding you. I moved my jacket back so I had quick access to my gun, my badge was there, I was like, I'm watching this, I'm in a Christian bookstore, didn't even connect the dots that what would this big crazy biker dude be going doing in a Christian bookstore. So I'm watching this guy. The closer I watched him, I started reading his patches. He had one like the one we saw. Exposure to the sun, S-O-N prevents burning things like that I'm like this guy's a Christian Christian biker dude imagine that and I judge the man as to being a guy who's gonna rob the joint rob a bookstore really what you gonna get 25 bucks <laughs> I prejudged him we do it all the time church if you work in a restaurant a group of people walk in you're like oh boy he's the big tippers here because they don't look like they're gonna tip very well for whatever reason you come to that conclusion we do it all the time church I ain't going to share the gospel with him because he ain't going to accept it. How do you know that? We make, we prejudge people. We do it all the time. I tell people all the time, I said, I got the, my grandson's the cutest kid in the world. Am I biased? Yes. <laughs> Severely biased. We all have biases. We all have prejudices. And there's still no excuse. None. There was a very harsh prejudice between these Jews and these Gentiles, especially those Samaritans. And Jesus said, it's no excuse. The gospel's for all people. And you come into contact with people all the time, and you judge in your mind who's worthy for you to share it with and who's not. That's a sin, church. That is sinful. The Spirit of God may prompt you and move you to share, and you don't, because he is X, Y, or Z, or he looks like whatever. Church, you got to get past that. We won't even share with our neighbors. There's a time when neighbors knew each other. Now we're building six foot privacy fences trying not to know who our neighbor is. Well, what about this gospel? What about people's real needs? Jesus never hesitated to meet a real need of somebody. Never. And church, we'll find excuse after excuse to not do it. 
There was so much implication, so much application in the verses we covered today. And I'm going to ask you because I don't know what you're doing in your life. I don't know. We'll depart from here. Many Christians won't even open their Bible till next Sunday when I say, hey, open to this chapter in the book. Many Christians won't take the time to pray except maybe I now lay me down to sleep or maybe thank you for this food. And many Christians won't dare share this love that they have for this awesome, wonderful God who's done so much for you. And that's a shame, church. But if we don't do it, who is? You think they're going to do that in schools? Probably not.